Well, we are here on the Mount of Beatitudes, and this is a beautiful spot, obviously a lovely chapel. You can walk around when we're done and look down on some of the hillsides. People often ask, how could the Lord have taught and had 5,000 people hear him? Because we're only 50, and I promise you, if there weren't other folks around, even if we didn't have whispers, I could make myself be heard by you all. It's one thing the military taught me. But 5,000 people in an open air setting would be difficult to hear. And some folks think, oh, well, maybe supernaturally Jesus allowed them to be able to hear him. But if you actually read the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes there in chapter five, it almost sounds all a sing-song type of quality. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you hear what he said? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so you could almost echo these phrases down the mountain and everyone would have been able to understand what Jesus was saying. I'm not gonna focus per se on all the various blessings, the beatitudes. As you walked up the path, you saw some of them inscribed. Blessed are the various ones. I guess my question for you, do you think each of the various blessings deals only with a particular person? Or do all of us have the promise of each of the blessings? You ever thought about that? Because the blessings are for the poor to receive the kingdom of heaven, those who mourn to be comforted, the gentle to inherit the earth, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness to be satisfied, the merciful to receive mercy, the pure in heart to see God, the peacemakers to be called sons of God, those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, again, to have the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people will insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I would submit that all of us really will benefit from each of those blessings because as we become more Christ-like, we should model, I used the word emulate the other day with your favorite character, but we should model those various characteristics. And in other places we are promised we will receive the kingdom of heaven. We will be satisfied if we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we will be called sons and daughters of God. But I want to point to the next phrase even in that sermon where the Lord said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes saltless, how can it be made salty again? Even water is something that has to be mixed with salt. I read a book, first time I came here, I was reading, ironically, the book Contiki. Anybody ever read Contiki? It's a story of these guys who'd lived through World War II and decided to float a raft all the way across the Pacific Ocean. They took quantities of fresh water and of course they would capture rainwater whenever they could. But water alone, at least in terms of our physical bodies, was not enough. They had to have salt to balance the electrolytes in their body. And there's a point to which as well, we do not realize our thirst unless there is salt present in our system and we recognize the imbalance. I think the Lord has called us to be salt to those in the world around us because some of them are oblivious enough or I'll say ignorant enough, and ignorance is simply not knowing, that they don't know how thirsty they are. And there's living water available to them in the person of Jesus Christ, but we are called to be salt to help them recognize the very thirst that they have and that can only be satisfied by the living water. The Lord went on in the, the same passage to say, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. One of the themes that we have emphasized at Lamb and Lion Ministries is the descent of darkness in our world. You feel it. You recognize it if you read the newspapers or watch the news, even in our own country, which at one time our founders cited to be a city on a hill. And now, is there much light emulating for, emanating from our country? No. 
there's a tremendous rise of darkness. But as Adrian Rogers said, this world is getting gloriously dark. What did he mean by that? Because as I'll talk about in the next few nights, Scripture is very clear that in the end times, the world will grow incredibly dark. But the darker the world gets, the easier it is for the light to shine in the darkness. I'll leave you to two other thoughts. We tend to focus in this passage on the blessings that we receive by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. To receive the kingdom of heaven, to be able to see God, to have our, our hungering and thirsting for righteousness fulfilled and satisfied. But I want to turn this idea of blessing on its head because if only thing I'm focused on is what I get out of this relationship, I don't think I'm in the right spirit and attitude relative to the Lord Himself. So I want to take you to Psalm 103. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. His benefits are incredible. They're beyond number. Beyond even these list of beatitudes. But a right relationship with the Lord means that I bless Him. You think, well, what could I possibly do that would bless God? What, what does He need from me? It's not what He needs, but it's what He desires. And that is when we are in relationship with Him, when we are in a right heart attitude, then the worship we offer Him, the blessing we give Him, brings joy to the Lord. And it is the right relationship. I'll contrast that as I close with Psalm chapter 2. Some of you are familiar with this. Speaking again of the darkness descending on our land. Psalm 2 opens, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take their counsel together against Yahweh and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. And as you read down this chapter, it ends with this in verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun. Some of your translations will say, kiss the sun, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And this is the eternal option, either to do homage to the Son, to bless the Son, to worship the Son, lest His wrath abide on any who reject the free option of salvation, the gift and the blessings that come with us, with it, and then the wrath of God resides on them. So as we sit in this place and we think about all the blessings the Lord's poured out upon us, all the promises we have to anticipate at His return or at our home going, whichever occurs first, I want you to take a moment, even in this place, where we think about blessed is the person who has all these traits. And I want you to take an opportunity as you walk around this beautiful chapel to bless Him, to do homage to Him, and to worship Him in your own heart. Father, I thank you for this time we've had in this place. There's many, many people from many nations. There are interruptions to our routine, but yet I pray that your Spirit give us a time of solitude, of peace, of blessedness, and that we in turn take this opportunity to bless you. It's the name of Jesus, our Messiah, that I pray. Amen.